All right, let's continue with our magic items. The next one we have here is the Crystalline Chronicle. Then we've got the Demonomicon of Igwil. Boy, that's a mouthful right there. And don't forget that Igwil is just another name for Tasha there. Devotee's Censor. We got the Duplicitous Manuscript and the Eldritch Claw Tattoo. So several new items to look at here. So starting with this first one here, notice it can only be attuned by a wizard. A lot of these are class specific, same here. So now we have an etched crystal sphere, the size of a grapefruit, hums faintly and pulses with irregular flares of inner light. While you're touching the crystal, you can retrieve and store information and spells within the crystal at the same rate as reading and writing. When found, the crystal contains the following spells. Detect thoughts. Intellect Fortress, Rary's Telepathic Bond, Sending, Telekinesis, Tasha's Mind Whip, and Tensor's Floating Disc. So Dionk, I'd say, could definitely mix those up if they wanted, but that's a good little list to start with right there. So they tell you that it also functions as a spell book for you, so spell book for the wizard given there, with its spells and other writings psychically encoded within. While you're holding the crystal, you can use it as a spell casting focus for your wizard spells, so we see that over and over with these objects. And you'll know Mage Hand, Mind Sliver, and Message Cantrips if you don't already know them. The crystal will have three charges and it regains 1d3 every day at dawn, and while you're holding it, you can use it in the following way. First of all, you can spend one minute studying the information within the crystal, and you can expend one charge to replace one of your prepared wizard spells with a different spell in the book. So let you swap up a spell, gives you more versatility. When you cast a wizard spell, you can expend one charge to cast the spell without using any verbal, somatic, or material components up to 100 gold piece. So 100 gold piece could definitely add up over time. Always good to save that money. So next here is the Dominimicon of Igwil. This is an artifact, so you know this is going to be a powerful one here. An expansive treatise documenting the abysses, infinite layers, and inhabitants. The Dominimicon of Igwil is the most thorough and blasphemous tone of demonology in the multiverse. The tome recounts both the oldest and most current profanities of the abyss and demons. So it's got all their little nasty secrets here. Demons have attempted to censor the text, and while sections have been ripped from the book's spine, the general chapters remain ever-revealing demonic secrets. And the book holds more than blasphemies. Caged behind lines of script rolls a secret piece of the abyss itself, which keeps the book up to date no matter how many pages are removed, and it longs to be more than mere refer reference material. So it's going to have some random property. Properties. As usual, you can go to the DM's Guide. You can roll up two minor properties, which are beneficial, then one minor and major detrimental at the same time. It's got spells. The book has eight charges. It regains 1d8 expended charges every day at dawn. While holding it, you can cast as an action Tasha's hideous laughter from it, or to expend one or more of its charges to cast one of the following spells. Look, is it a save of a DC 20? Not bad. So you could use Magic Circle, one charge, Magic Jar, three, Planar Ally, three, Planar Binding, two, Planar Shift to Layers of the Abyss, only three charges, and then Summon Fiend, three charges. Not a bad list. Then they have Abyssal Reference. You can reference the Dominimicon whenever you make an intelligence check to discern information about demons or a wisdom survival check related to the Abyss. When you do so, you can add double your proficiency bonus to the check. So that's big. Looking right here first, you see this fiendish scourging. Your magic causes pain to fiends. While carrying the book, when you make a damage roll for a spell you cast against a fiend, you use the maximum possible result instead of rolling. How good is that? Don't even roll the dice, just take the maximum. Then they have ensnarement. While carrying the book, whenever you cast the magic circle spell, naming only fiends, or the planar binding spell targeting a fiend, the spell is cast at ninth level, regardless of what level spell slot you used. That's nice. Additionally, the fiend has disadvantage on the saving throw, so that's going to give them a big disadvantage overall. Then you have containment. The first ten pages of the Dominimicon are blank. As an action, while holding the book, you can target a fiend that you can see that is trapped within a magic circle. 
The Fiend must succeed on a DC-20 charisma saving throw with disadvantage or become trapped within one of the Domenimicon's empty blank pages, which fills with writing detailing the trapped creature's widely known name and depravities. Once used, this action can't be used again until the next dawn. When you finish a long rest, if you and the Domenimicon are on the same plane of existence, the trap creature of the highest challenge rating within the book can attempt to possess you. So here's the downfall of this book here. You must make a DC 20 charisma saving throw. On a failure, <clears throat> you are possessed by the creature, which controls you like a puppet. The possessing creature can release you as an action, appearing get up here. In the next closest unoccupied space, on a successful save, the fiend can try to possess you again for seven days. When the tome is discovered, it has 1d4 fiends occupying its pages, typically an assortment of demons. Destroying the Domenimicon. To destroy the book, six different demon lords must each tear out a sixth of the book's pages. In this, If this occurs, the pages reappear after 24 hours. Before all those hours pass, anyone who opens the book's remaining binding is transported to a layer of the abyss that lies hidden within the book. At the heart of this deadly semi-sentient domain lies a long-lost artifact, Fraz or Bulu's staff. If the staff is dragged from the pocket plane, the tome is reduced to a mundane and quite out-of-date copy of the Tome of Zix, the work that served as the foundation for the, for the Domenimicon. Once the staff emerges, the demon lord Frats or Blue instantly knows. So they set you up with a way to get rid of this. Again, you get some high level adventures like this type of abyss type fighting. There's a campaign form to run right there. Next, we have the Devotee Censor. So notice this one requires attunement by a cleric or a paladin. The rounded head of this flail is perforated with tiny holes arranged in symbols and patterns. The flail counts as a holy symbol for you. When you hit with an attack using the magic flail, the target takes an extra 1d8 radiant damage. As a bonus action, you can speak the command word to cause the flail to emanate a thin cloud of incense out to 10 feet for one minute. At the start of each of its turns, you and other creatures in the incense regain 1d4 hit points. This property can't be used again until the next dawn. So it's going to give you some extra damage and some healing at the same time. Next, we have the Duplicitous Manuscript. This requires attunement by a wizard. To you, this book is a magical spell book. So there's a repeated theme we see. To anyone else, the book appears to be a volume of verbose romance fiction. As an action, you can change the book's appearance and alter the plot of the romance. When found, the book contains the following spells. Hallucinatory Terrain, Major Image, Mirror Image, Mislead, Nostul's Magic Aura, Phantasmal Force, and Silent Image. It functions as a spell book for you. While you're holding the book, you can use it as a spell casting focus for your wizard spells. The book has three charges and it regains 1d3 expended charges daily at dawn. You can use the charges in the following ways while holding it. First here, if you spend one minute studying the book, you can expend one charge to replace one of your prepared wizard spells with a different spell in the book. It must be from the illusion, illusion school, so something we've seen with others. When a creature you see makes an intelligence investigation check to discern the true nature of an illusion spell you cast, or makes a saving throw against an illusion spell you cast, you can use your reaction and expend one charge to impose disadvantage. So definitely going to help you land those rolls on those spells. And then next here, <clears throat> we have the Eldritch Claw Tattoo, one of the uncommon ones. So they give the usual attunement as they have before, just talks about how it works, nothing different, and then magical strikes. While the tattoo is on your skin, your unarmed strikes are considered magical for the purpose of overcoming immunity and resistance to non-magical attacks. So notice this is about unarmed strikes here. And you gain a plus one bonus to attack and damage rolls. So that's nice. You can pretty much hit just about anything that you want to and get those pluses right along with it. They also tell you it has this extra ability called Eldritch Maul. As a bonus action, you can empower the tattoo for one minute. For the duration, each of your melee attacks with a weapon or an unarmed strike can reach a target up to 15 feet away. So it gives you usually a lot of extra reach. As inky tendrils launch toward the target, 
In addition, your melee attacks deal an extra 1d6 force damage on a hit. Once used, this bonus action can't be used again until the next dawn. So not a bad little item right there. Hope you enjoyed this video. Till next time, good luck and good gaming.